board. So welcome back to week two of weight management. Happy to see you all here. And um, so we're going to have a slight little review of uh, what's um, some of the issues that Scott went over last week. And then um, before we do that, like we always start out the session with if anybody is new, um, if you'd like to share with us how you found out about the classes, what you might hope to gain from these sessions, or just hello and uh, I'm here would be nice, you know? So in order to do that, you just unmute and uh, or raise your hand and I'll call on you. I'm looking in the room right now to see who's here. And and um, uh, so I see that Candace unmuted and I don't know if you wanna say hello or if you uh, unmuted on purpose to say hello or okay, I because you already, I think, we're here last week, so I get it. Anybody else who might care to share how they either heard about the classes or? Um... Yeah, I'm I'm Leslie and I started last week and started on the Sunday three o'clock and I heard about the class from my doctor and I'm hoping to get um, just a better handle on nutrition and some social support to do that. Great. Well, Leslie, we're happy to have you and uh, stick with uh, the classes. And you know they're recorded so that if you miss a class, you still can catch up on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else? Barbara. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Barbara Crane. And I found out about um, the group in Eugene when I was listening to uh, one of Dr. Greger's uh, talks. And so I started checking into it and that's how I, how I found you. I talked to uh, Charlie, I called to try to get in on a class and I realized that it was three and a half hours away. And he told me about this Zoom meeting. And so here I am. Well, welcome. I remember talking with you and we're happy to have you. We do sometimes have people from even back east, uh, east coast uh, that log on. So good for you for taking the leap. Uh, anybody else? new to the class or care to share how you found out or what you might like to get from it. We've got Lisa here. I don't know if she wants to uh, give a reminder about the book club. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Some new faces to me because I haven't been in the class in a few weeks. Um, my name's Lisa. I'm one of the fourth year medical students. Um, down in Los Angeles, and we have a book club going that started last year. So we're going to be meeting this Thursday, the 22nd at seven o'clock to talk about Fiber Fueled. This is our second meeting for the book, but it's okay if you um, didn't catch the first one, you're still welcome to join. And then we'll be meeting one more time in March to finish up the book too. So it'll be on Zoom and I'm sure the information is in Scott's emails too. Um, and uh, probably you can find it on the Facebook page as well if you're on there. Um, I just came in to say a quick hello and then I should go study even though I'd rather stay in here. <laughs> Before you leave, Lisa, if I were to log into your book club, are you going to call on me and I'm going to feel embarrassed or what? How does that work? Good question. No, I um, I may call on you briefly just to give you an opportunity, invite you to share your thoughts, but you're welcome to just 
pass the hot potato on. Um, yeah, it's very low key, even if you haven't read the book and you just want to come listen to hear what other people have to say, that is perfectly fine. You don't have to turn your camera on. You don't have to unmute. Whatever you're comfortable with is fine. And those of you in the class, uh, we've told you about, sometimes we use medical students. Uh, we've used one, Lisa, is the medical student who's been uh, uh, sharing her knowledge uh, with a number of you in past classes, uh, the reviews have been stellar. And um, so if she's available, she'll help you out. If not, I will help you out. And if not, then we will keep searching around and find somebody to support you in your transition. Yeah, some of you have emailed me. I haven't really updated my Calendly link. So if you've been clicking on that and you don't see anything available, it's because I don't know what my schedule is. So just go ahead and email me and we'll find a time. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, keep I learning. Been... Study hard. I, I, I get the, um, the emails from Scott reminding me about the meeting, but I don't get the newsletter and I've signed up for the newsletter and it said there's already that my email's already on there, but I don't get it. So I don't know what's going on with that. I mean, I guess I could try another email or it's going to spam or something, but uh, are, are, you about, are you talking about, are you talking about the newsletter based provider, the, the Eugene plant based provider newsletter that comes out once a month? Or are you talking about the, the newsletter, because email newsletter is the same thing for class. Are you talking about the weekly class email or are you talking about the monthly? I get the weekly one where you remind me of the class, but there's not a lot of other stuff in there, right? Well, there's a lot. I mean, that's what I'm talking about here. Let me share my screen so I can show you guys what's all in the, the newsletter every week. Just so you have an idea. So let's see. Here's my emails. So here it is. This is for this week. So is this recognizable? You get this every week? Um, you should, you should be getting... I don't, not sure. No, I'm, I'm not. It's live lifestyle medicine class. You should be getting that every Sunday morning if you're signed up for the newsletter. And uh, there's a lot of information here. So here's the information about this week's class and then next week's class. Here's the link for, for the classes every week. No, I'm not getting that. There's a whole upcoming events section, the book club information. You can sign up for the book club. There's Lisa's email. Nope. Um, yeah, so check your junk file if you're not getting those. Um, well, I have. What, what, uh, okay, well, let me make sure. Let me let me double check. Make sure you're you're on there. So it's Brian Sorrells. Yeah, B E Sorrells, right? Hotmail, right? Let me just while we're I'll just keep scrolling through this, but I'll just look you up real quick just to make sure you're on here. And that's me. So it's S O R double L S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're on here. Okay. And it shows you uh, shows you've been opening them. It shows you opened this email on February 18th at 7:42 in the morning. So you're, you're okay. Already, well, you let me check it, it, and I'll get back to you. And then there's another okay. there's newsletter. Maybe that's the one I'm not getting. Sorry to take up time. No, it's okay. The, the newsletter is uh, through Eugene Plant-Based Providers. So if you uh, go to Eugene Plant-Based Providers website here. Oh, that's where I sign up for that. Okay. You can sign up for the newsletter. It's, uh, let's see, that's the Zoom. That's the in-person classes. There's the, our Zoom classes, which you don't need to sign up for right here. You can join the newsletter here. And, okay. and that's for, that's comes out once a month for Eugene Plant-Based Providers. Okay. But, but the, if you miss, you're welcome, but it's for other people's information. If you do miss that, or you haven't signed up for that particular newsletter, the uh, newsletters are archived at the bottom here. So here's February's already. You can read any of the newsletters here. Usually about two weeks into the month, they go up on, on the website anyway. But if you want to get them at the beginning of the month when they come out, you can sign up for the, the newsletter right there. Thank All you. Right. Mm -hmm. Welcome. 
Okay, are there any thoughts from anyone else who cares to share anything, wants to say hello, says they're, you know, like doing great or having problems with anything? We want to make these classes for you and kind of address the issues that you are most interested in. I'm looking through the room. I don't see any hands up yet. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Ken. Hi. Um, well, I've made um, sweet potato fries and they're great, but Get on. the recipe I use is kind of got, it asks for oil. So I was wondering if anybody's got a magic recipe for sweet potato fries that doesn't use oil. You can just oh, do it yeah. in the air fryer. You don't need yeah. any oil. You just probably put some paprika on them and anything else. You could you use can roll it in, in. Go ahead. So I was just gonna say you can you can roll them in um, corn in um, cornmeal and put some seasonings in the cornmeal and that gives it a nice crunch. Corn in meal. an air fryer. In an air fryer. Yeah. Would Jeff Novak approve of cornmeal? <laughs> Good thought. <laughs> um, he would say that if you're, you know, it's uh, somewhat refined or it's a refined, you know, not as healthy as the corn itself. You could eat the corn, the whole corn with the, with the fries. Uh, and, you know, that would be the healthiest choice. It would yeah. fill you up and, you could lose weight, you know, but it doesn't, you're not, I don't think that's your problem or concern. So whatever you choose, if you wanted to use a little of the um, processed corn. corn. Well, I haven't had any around because I thought it was, you know, he, he uses it in his speech um, as, as an example of something processed when you could just eat the corn. Yeah. So, so I kind of steered away from it, but I have followed someone's advice on this in this class using um, cornstarch, and that's just the endosperm. So I don't know if that's really processed. Uh, that gives a lot of things a nice crunch, but I don't know about. The, I don't know how it would work on the fries. I might have to give that a try too. Yeah, surprised you weren't here last week, Ken, since it was all about Jeff Novick last week. Calorie oh, I was here. I was here, but oh, I, you were? I couldn't, for some reason, I couldn't see the video, but I've seen it enough times. I, <laughs> kind of sure. knew, I knew what he was doing. Um, yeah, I was here last week. Oh, okay. I never get tired of seeing this or here. I never get tired of that. That's, That's great. One of, coolest, one of the coolest speeches ever because he's just funny. Or at least mm -hmm. I like his humor. It's kind of like um, Bob Newhart. Yeah. All right. So are there any other comments or suggestions from anybody? Just unmute yourself and you can speak and yeah. come up. I, Go I ahead. A couple of questions. I, what I'm struggling with is... Um, uh, you know, I, I I haven't figured out how to, I, I do a lot of typically sauteing things in oil and I haven't figured out how to do that. And, <clears throat> you know, I don't really like just boiled vegetables. You know, they don't taste very good to me. And I'm also addicted to having something sweet at night with sugar in it. So I don't know, what do I do about my cravings? So, you know, any, yeah, I mean, um, Okay, the, the first question is about uh, the, the oil. What you can use for sauteing is water or vegetable broth. Okay. Are you familiar with those options? Yeah, um, I haven't tried them. Well, that's what I would encourage you. Try it. I believe you'll like it. Okay. Do, and your body you know will to, like it. And do you know how to look up things on YouTube? You can, you can, you can actually get... Um, examples of people water sauteing vegetables on YouTube if you know how to search on YouTube. Okay. Water okay, sauteing. so so that's that's one issue. 
Then the sweet issue. I know that I was a sweetaholic uh, about 12 years ago. I'd eat every brownie, cookie, piece of cake in the emergency department that I could get my hands on. If I had a tongue blade in my hands, I could whip off a little sample. But when I started filling myself up by eating like Dr. Greger recommends with Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen, I was getting so many nutrients that I had been deprived of, like particularly fiber, that once I really increased the amount of fiber in my doc diet, the cravings went away. But until they go away, you may want to use something like uh, fruit, like a date or a couple dates for a sweet uh, taste for your night. Okay. okay. Grapes are sweet. Any kind of fruit, use that for your sweetness. Okay. I'll try it. Thank you. Give it a try. Good. Yeah. Thanks for the question. And keep them coming. Marsha? Yesterday in the car, I was hearing this, just getting to the station, and they said, if you want to lose weight, skip the bagels and stuff and have a big breakfast. The stuff they mentioned for breakfast was not what you should be eating, bacon, eggs, and stuff like that. And I thought, no, to myself. <laughs> but Where did you was, hear that at? On the radio yesterday. Yeah, so you must be careful as to what your sources are that you're listening to. <clears throat> For sure. I, I, and uh, obviously you ran into a source which, um, you know, if they're promoting um, highly saturated foods, foods that have been deemed carcinogenic by the World Health Organization, you probably would want to turn, change the channel. <laughs> Okay. Anybody else have any comments they'd like to make? Uh, Emmy? Uh, I don't have a problem. I just want to make a comment about our Sunday classes. <clears throat> I've been on this Zoom class for a couple of years now, which is awesome. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But showing up on Sundays and seeing people that I see on this Zoom and getting the energy of Charlie and Scott and others in the room is I, th I find inspiring. So if, if you're not coming to those, it's time to sign up. And anybody is welcome to come, even if you didn't come to the first few, you're welcome to come. But try to let us know because we do have limited space, but we have about, I think, space for, I don't know, 15 people in each class. So there should be plenty of space, whichever class you choose to pick. Uh, Nancy, thank you, Emmy, for sharing that. Nancy. Yes, I've been out of the country for a month, and I'm really tired, so if I fall asleep, um, <laughs> I spent the night at the L.A. airport last night. Wow. Um, just after, like this afternoon. Um, but anyway, one thing I've been wondering about, all of the recipes pretty much call for um, maple syrup as a sweetener. And I went and looked at nutrition levels, and it seems to me like um, molasses has more nutrition in it, and yet it's never used in the whole food plant-based recipes. So I was just wondering what was going on. I mean, it seems like it would be a good substitute, but I, I just wonder if there's something that I don't know about that I shouldn't do that. I personally agree that molasses uh, would probably be um a better choice um however the best choice i think would be date sugar or date powder uh because that is totally a whole plant food that's just chopped up i'm not sure how molasses is uh made you know how it's how it's uh, processed well it's from the sugar cane and it's it's before the sugar's been refined, you know, the, so it's, it's yeah. got. It's so here. it would be potentially, um, you know, that's what I started with back 12 years ago until we transitioned more to date, date sugar. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? And well, there's a lot of recipes with maple syrup in it, you know, I mean, that's yeah. very, very common. 
Yeah, I wouldn't use a lot of maple syrup and I wouldn't be using a lot of recipes. I would be using a lot of whole plant foods uh, are really the healthiest choices. And uh, the recipes that are using maple syrup oftentimes are pancakes with maple syrup of some sort. Well, the pancake is a very processed kind of food and it would probably be healthier to stick with the uh, whole grain oatmeal, uh, the whole grain uh, like rice, the legumes like beans or lentils, uh, eating the whole food as opposed to the highly processed ones. Well, I came across um, and and Esselstein, Esselstein? Yeah, Esselstein. Esselstein and I, I think Jane is, is the other. They they have um, kind of a cooking show on on YouTube once in a while that I see. And they have a dressing that I just totally, totally love. And they call it the 3 two, one dressing. And it's got three parts. Oh. Um, balsamic yeah. vinegar. Balsamic vinegar. Two parts mustard and one part maple syrup, and I always yeah. put some garlic in it because I grow lots of garlic and I have garlic. But I'll tell you, you know that that just—I mean, it makes such a great salad. I mean, I could just—I <laughs> I, I need I need something, some dressing on my salad, and that's one of my favorites. But of course, anything with balsamic vinegar, I think, is pretty fantastic. I, I, I use this. I use the same. I use the same dressing, Nancy. Oh, really? <laughs> Did yeah. you get it from them? Uh, no, I picked it up somewhere else a long time ago. It's just huh. so easy. Three, two, one. Yeah, three parts yeah. balsamic vinegar, two parts mustard, and one part uh, maple syrup. But yeah, it's just a little bit on. Doesn't take very a little goes a long way on on a, on a salad. So then I I I've, I've tried kind of experimented with. I don't remember if I actually experimented or thought I should experiment with the molasses instead of the the um, maple syrup. It would be okay to do that. <laughs> uh, in fact, I got back um, to Portland Airport, and they have this Evergreens restaurant. And oh my gosh, it was just so good to get, a, you know, a whole foods plant based meal. <laughs> I mean, not that I didn't have them while I was I was gone, and people were very tried to be very accommodating and so on. And of course, I did splurge, and I had a few. Maracuja ice cream because I totally love those. And I don't know what my weight situation is after all of all of the food that I ate. But um, anyway, um, I right. have to watch calories for a bit or watch that for whatever. Watch what I eat for a bit more. We'll it's a journey. You keep uh, experimenting with your life and do what you think is right. Listen to the science and you make a decision as to what you want to do. Yeah, well, I got to swim with a whale shark. That was pretty cool. That sounds cool. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else have anything they want to add or subtract? I just want to say something about sweeteners. I like a date paste. <clears throat> I make a date paste and I make it as thick or as thin as I need to for whatever I'm using it in. And for me, that works pretty well. And it keeps in the fridge for three or four days. Sounds like a good plan. I think uh, Gregor would think that would be okay. It's a whole food. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else? I just wanted to say about the salad dressing that you guys mentioned. Go it's ahead, really Kim. good. It's really good with just mustard and balsamic. You don't you need the sweetener, I don't think. Try it if you don't want to have the extra calories or the extra sugar in your system. Just mustard and balsamic. It's good, too. I'll have to try so, that much, one, yeah. so much of this is mind over matter and getting your tongue used to different tastes. And, uh, you know, what works for you, uh, you're going to listen to others and make a decision. I'm going to go ahead and I want to kind of sum up a little bit. Uh, I'm looking for a volunteer in the group uh, who's willing to make a comment about the chart that I'm going to show. And I don't know if I'll get a volunteer or not, but I'm going to 
pull up a chart that we haven't haven't shown you quite yet. It's this. It's a variation of what Scott showed you the last time. Let's see. Let me open this up. How do I make this bigger? Huh. All right. Close what? Close your toolbar, Charlie. Oh, where is the toolbar? It's well, I'm looking on the at left. The, yeah, it's on the left. Can you all see this at all? Yeah. All yeah. right. It's, so it's who wants to tell me what's involved on this side of the red line? and what's involved on this side of this red line. Anybody care to step up to the plate and discuss what these foods in green are about? I'll give it a shot. Good, go for it. Okay, those look like, oh, <laughs> oh sorry about the little barker. Um, those look like cal uh, low calorie density foods. Excellent. Excellent. Low calorie density food. You get 100 calories a pound of non starchy veggies, 300 calories in a pound of fruit, and four to 600 calories uh, in a pound of either unrefined complex carbohydrates, potatoes, whole grains, legumes. These foods uh, in green are whole foods found in nature. They have vitamins and minerals and antioxidants, phytochemicals and micronutrients. They contain fiber and water, which create bulk and increased satiety. These are the foods that are gonna bring you your health. And if you remember what Scott said about the number of pounds of food that the average person eats in a day, about three to four pounds. If you were just eating three to four pounds of non-starchy vegetables, you'd only be getting 300 calories a day. It wouldn't be enough for you to have enough energy and to live a vital, healthy life. If you were to just eat three or four pounds of fruit, you could get nine to 1200 calories a day. That would be above the concentration camp level of about 800, but you still might be missing a number of nutrients. So it's a good idea to incorporate some of the, any amount of these non-starchy veggies, um, you know, maybe a pound or so of fruit, and then the rest of your intake coming from uh, legumes, whole grains, uh, and perhaps some potatoes. So if you eat under the green, you're really going to be healthy. And these foods over here tend to be in the standard American diet. But wait a second, there's some foods in purple. So what do we have to say about the nuts? What's the issue with nuts and why do you think they're in purple? Anybody? Fat. Fat. Yeah. So look at the calorie density of nuts and seeds, nut butters and tahini. Tahini is in uh, hummus that you buy in the store and it comes in different amounts. Like you could get a uh, hummus that has like two and a half grams of fat in it, which is the tahini, or you can get one that's 13 grams in a serving. So be mindful of the fat, fact that these nuts and seeds have 2,800 calories a pound. It's a pretty high calorie dense food. You don't eat a lot of them. And that's why Gregor recommends a quarter of a cup of nuts, which is about 150 calories for the day along with a tablespoon of flaxseed adds a little more. That would provide you with about 10% of your fat calories. Um, and that would be a healthy amount if you're, you know, wanting to either lose weight or you're, um, you know, just 
not wanting to gain weight. Now, if you eat a lot of nuts, if you're eating a cup of nuts a day, you may be gaining weight and that may be something that you want to do. Avocados are another one. They have healthy fats, but they're 750 calories a pound. So be careful. I've had a number of people who tell me, I've been doing this plant-based, but I'm not losing weight. And I say, are you doing avocados? Yeah, I have a couple, maybe three avocados a day. And, you know, like, okay, they're getting a lot of calories from the avocado and they're not losing weight because of that. And then the last point I want to make is look at all oils, the most calorie dense food on the planet. If you want to subject your body to that, uh, it is definitely your choice. But if you stay down and uh, eat under the green, you will have an adequate amount of calories. You won't have an overabundance. You'll be getting plenty of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and protein and fiber that you need. By the way, these oils, zero fiber. And that's the deficiency in our diet. Okay, I'm done with that. Now I want to get on to the first video and then we'll stop and we will go from there. Let's see the first video. Is the obesity paradox real or a myth? Here's the first video. I'm not playing all these videos, by the way, just a selection here and there, but this is the first one. Martin Luther King Jr. warned that human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable, and the same may be true of the human lifespan. In the 1800s, life expectancy was less than 40, but it's been steadily increasing over the last two centuries, gaining about two years per decade. That is, until recently. Longevity gains have faltered or even reversed. Thanks to the obesity epidemic, we may now be raising the first American generation to live shorter lives than their parents. The downward trend in longevity is expected to accelerate as the current younger generation, who started out heavier and earlier than ever before, uh, ages into adulthood. If the obesity epidemic continues unchecked, current trends signal a potential looming social and economic catastrophe. In the coming decades, some predict we may lose uh, two to five or more years of life expectancy in the United States. I mean, to put that into perspective, a miracle cure for all forms of cancer would only add 3.5 years to the average American lifespan. In other words, reversing the obesity epidemic might save more lives than curing cancer. The evidence being overweight increases your risk for debilitating diseases like diabetes is considered indisputable. But surprisingly, there's controversy surrounding body weight and overall mortality. In 2013, a CDC scientist published a meta-analysis in the Journal of the American Medical Association suggesting being overweight was actually advantageous. Uh, yes, grade 2 or 3 obesity, like being average height, 5 foot 6, and weighing about 215 plus pounds, was associated with living a shorter life, but grade 1 obesity, uh, between about 185 to 215 pounds at that height, was not, and just being Overweight, 155 to 185 pounds, appeared to be protective compared to those who were normal weight, 115 to 155. The overweight individuals, uh, BMI 25 to 30, appeared to live the longest. Headline writers were giddy. Right? Being overweight can extend your life. Dreading your diet? Don't worry, plump people live longer. Extra pounds might mean lower chance of death. Not surprisingly, this study ignited a firestorm of controversy in the public health community. The study was called ludicrous, flawed, misleading. The chair of nutrition at Harvard lost his cool, calling the study really a pile of rubbish. Uh, fearing the food industry might exploit this study in the same way the petroleum industry misuses controversy over climate change. Public health advocates can't just dismiss data they find inconvenient, though. I mean, science is science. 
But how could being overweight increase the risk of life-threatening diseases, yet at the same time make you live longer? Uh, this became known as the obesity paradox. The solution to the puzzle appears to lie with two major sources of bias. The first being confounding by smoking. Right? The nicotine in tobacco can lead to weight loss, so if you're skinnier because you smoke, well, then no wonder you'd live a shorter life with a slimmer waist. Right? The failure to control for the effect of smoking in studies purporting to show an obesity paradox uh, leads to the dangers of obesity being grossly underestimated. The second major source of bias is reverse causality. Instead of lower weight leading to life-threatening diseases, is it more likely that life-threatening diseases are leading to lower weight? I mean, conditions such as hidden tumors, chronic heart and lung disease, alcoholism, and depression can all cause unintentional weight loss months or even years before they're even diagnosed. It's normal to be overweight in this country, right? So people who are, who are abnormally thin, in other words, ideal weight, I mean, could actually be taking care of themselves, right? But maybe heavy smokers, elderly and frail, or seriously ill with weight loss from their disease. To put the obesity paradox issue to the test once and for all, the Global BMI Mortality Collaboration was formed, reviewing data for more than 10 million people from hundreds of studies in dozens of countries, the largest evaluation of BMI and mortality in history. To help eliminate bias, they omitted smokers and those with known chronic disease, and then excluded the first five years of follow-up to try to remove from the analysis those with undiagnosed conditions who lost weight due to an impending death. And the results? were clear. Being overweight and all grades of obesity were associated with a significantly greater risk of dying prematurely. Uh, so adjusting for these biases leads to eliminating the obesity paradox altogether. In other words, the so-called obesity paradox appears to be just a myth. Indeed, when intentional weight loss is actually put to the test, people live longer. There are bariatric surgery studies, like the SOS trial, that show weight loss reduces long-term mortality, and, and randomizing people to weight loss through lifestyle changes shows the same thing. Uh, losing a dozen pounds through diet and exercise was found to be associated with a 15% drop in overall mortality. Now, I mean, exercise alone may extend the lifespan even without weight loss, uh, but there also appears to be a similar longevity benefit of weight loss through dietary means alone. Okay, so we're going to stop there for a moment, and I'm going to kind of take a look at the gallery and see what you all have to say about this. Have any of you been living under the myth that being overweight is healthier than being an ideal body weight? Any of you? Because there is a lot of confusion when it comes to this topic. I hope that what Dr. Greger just went over busted the myth that weight gives you some advantage to live longer or healthier in any way. And, and so that's one of the things that we deal with on a regular basis. It's hard for us to talk with patients sometimes when they live under a myth that, and they tell us well, you know, a little extra weight is probably healthy because that's what I heard. And that's part of the obesity paradox. So you all get what the a paradox is about. When they did the original studies, they didn't account for the fact that people who were smoking were had a lower body weight, but and that people who were actually ill had lower body weights. But when you look at the statistics and who's dying and when, it makes it appear as though those with a lower body weight, for some reason, seem to be healthier. You may want to listen to that video again if you have any confusion on this topic. And um, 
as you navigate in this world and make decisions about what you want for yourself. Now, then the question is, is can you actually make it to your ideal body weight? And the answer is yes, you can do this. But it becomes harder as you lose weight. <laughs> you may have to move a little bit more uh, to burn up a few more calories. You may have to eat a little less calorie density foods as you continue on in your course of weight loss. And that's kind of confusing for a number of people. They lose weight for a while and then they kind of plateau out. They stop losing. They become frustrated and want to give up. And we're here to encourage you along on the path to not give up, to keep at it, and to try to get as close to your ideal body weight as possible. You don't have to do it. We're just trying to get you as healthy as possible. Now, are there any questions about this? Yeah, go ahead, Candace. Uh, unmute yourself. Let's see, I don't hear, it looks like you're unmuted, but I didn't hear anything. Uh, can any of you hear it in the room? There's something about your microphone. Mm. There you go, wait. Try again. Uh, we could hear it earlier, so that's interesting. Let me put this, let me mute you, or at least hit this, and try uh, muting and unmuting yourself again. Is her volume up? Is your volume up? Okay, you're muted now. Now go ahead and unmute. There you are unmuted. And the volume, that is so bizarre. Now, the other thing you could try is log out and log back in. And then uh, we'll call on you. Um, why don't you try that? Log out, log back in, and, and we'll see you back in a minute or two. Who else has a question? Uh, that they'd like to discuss with anybody. Uh, I see Nancy has a hand up. Yeah, because I had been chubby to fat to obese most of my life, I mean, once in a while I'd lose some weight, but then I'd gain it back and so on. Um, I just, you know, I'm down now. Well, in fact, one, one nurse, when I went to the doctor um, said, oh, you shouldn't lose any more weight. Um, and I just really don't know what I should weigh. And I read somewhere where a BMI of 20, 21 is probably ideal. So I, is that what, um, I mean, cause sometimes I still feel kind of fat, even, even though I probably not anymore, but, um, the BMI you want to keep above is 19. You don't want to drop below 19, 19. but there's a lot of people that have normal, body mass index, but then they have a lot of fat fat around their organs and this, well, this that visceral fat, which is an unhealthy fat. And then there's people that are, their body mass index is, is high, maybe even in the overweight category, but they have a lot of muscle and they don't have much of any visceral fat. So so BMI is not a perfect tool by, by any stretch, but um, it's really the, where, where our fat is distributed is what's the most important thing. But but when we just talk about general and generalities, BMI, as long as you're staying above 19 on your BMI, you're fine. Okay, because I, you know, it was just like, well, I've never, who knows, maybe in fifth grade, I was <laughs> the ideal weight. But other than that, um, I, it's hard to know when you've never been there. What's your height in uh, feet and inches? Five one. Yeah, you can look this up. Um, you do a BMI search and it goes to a calculator and then you can plug in what your weight is. And at 5'1", um, I'm, I'm just going to plug in uh, a weight here. A weight of uh, 112 is uh, between 18.5 and 25, a healthy weight. So you can 
keep plugging that in and you can make a decision, whatever your weight actually is. If you were at 112 pounds, it would be, you'd be a BMI of 21, which is right in the normal range, which means you could go down below that. Probably, I don't know if you could go down to a hundred or, you know, you could go up to 120 or 25. I don't know what the numbers are, but just do a Google search and you can calculate yeah. this out for yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just real, kind of weird that I don't know what I should play after all these years. But well, anyway. Uh, a perfectly ideal weight would be in the uh, somewhere around the 112 range for your okay. height. But okay. like Scott said, there are some other factors associated where the distribution of fat is. But, you know, uh, the other is we can use waist circumference and other kinds of things. But a lot of this is dependent upon how you're feeling and also what, you know, what, if you're taking pills or not taking pills, if you're otherwise healthy, uh, if you're taking any pills and you want to get off of them, you may want to reduce your weight a bit more. Just a thought. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the range. <laughs> just not sure exactly. If you're what in the, the range, numbers should be, and I guess I'm just too, maybe too, too, OCD about it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and that. It'd be a problem sometime also. So if you need further reassurance, we'll be happy to talk to you more at a I future date. I want to have date. your problem. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, okay, Jamie. Uh, anybody else? I think Candace is back in if you want to try her again. Okay, Candace, give it a try. Um you're talking but for some reason there is some i don't get it why we can't hey. hear you her microphone just stopped working it looks like um so maybe you could type something in the chat we could look at that uh if you type a note in the chat room and then we'll be happy to kind of answer that as time goes on. Anybody else? All right, I don't see anything else right now. So I'm gonna share my screen again. We're gonna to go to another video. And that'll give you time to get your thoughts together a little bit more. And we're going to go to eating more to weigh less. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a kind of an unbelievable concept. How do you eat more to weigh less? What happens if you have people add fruit to their regular diet? Three apples or three pears a day as snacks between meals on top of whatever else they were eating. Uh, fruit is low in calories, but not zero, so if you add food to people's diet, even healthy foods, won't they gain weight? No, they lost a couple pounds. Maybe it was all that fiber? Uh, if you remember, we learned our gut bacteria can create anti-obesity compounds from fiber. That's why they also had a cookie group. Three apples, three pears, or three cookies with enough oats in them to have about the same amount of fiber as the fruit. Despite the fiber, adding cookies to one's diet does not lead to weight loss. They think the weight-reducing secret of fruit if it is its low energy density, meaning you eat a lot of food for just a few calories, so it fills you up. Energy density. It's a relatively new concept that has been identified as an important factor in body weight control in both adults and in children and adolescents. Energy density is defined as the amount of calories per unit weight of a food or beverage. Water, for example, provide, provides a significant amount of, of weight without adding calories, uh, fiber too. Thus, foods high in fiber and water are generally lower in energy density. 
On the other hand, because dietary fat provides the greatest amount of calories per weight, uh, foods high in fat are generally high in energy density. Uh, the CDC offers some examples of high-energy density foods are like bacon, you know, lots of calories in a small package. A medium-energy density food is like a bagel, and a low-density food typified by fruits and vegetables. In general, the lower the better, with two exceptions. Soda is heavy, uh, so heavy that by energy density it looks less harmful than it is, and nuts have so much fat they appear less healthy than they are. Otherwise, though, the science supports a relationship between energy density and body weight, such that consuming diets lower in energy density may be an effective strategy for weight control. This is because people tend to eat a consistent weight of food, so when there's less calories per pound, calorie intake is reduced. A small drop in energy density can lead to a small drop in weight, and the greater the decrease in energy density, the greater the weight loss. Energy density can be reduced in a variety of ways, such as the addition of fruits and vegetables to recipes, or by lowering the fat or sugar content. And indeed, that's how we evolved, eating predominantly low-energy density foods, such as fruits, vegetables, plants, and tubers, starch-filled roots like sweet potatoes. The first study to emphasize how fruits and vegetables could affect energy density and food intake was conducted more than 30 years ago. Researchers were able to cut people's caloric intake nearly in half, from 3,000 calories a day down to 1,570 without cutting portions, just by substituting less calorie-dense foods, which means lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, compared to a high-energy density meal with lots of meat and sugar. Nearly half the calories, but they enjoyed the meals just as much. They tried this in Hawaii, putting people on a traditional Hawaiian diet with all the plant foods they could eat lost an average of 17 pounds in just 21 days, resulting in better cholesterol, triglycerides, blood sugars, and blood pressure. Caloric intake dropped 40%, but not by eating less food. In fact, they lost 17 pounds in 21 days eating more food, four pounds of food. But because plants tend to be so calorically dilute, one can stuff oneself without getting the same kind of weight gain. And the energy density of foods is of interest for weight management, not only because it allows people to eat satisfying portions while limiting calories, but also because reductions in energy density are associated with improved dietary quality. For example, lower energy dense diets associated with lower risk of pancreatic cancer. Lower energy density foods tend to be healthier foods, so we get the best of both worlds. So I'm going to stop for a moment, and I'm going to ask you all in the room, if you have friends, family members, if you're talking to yourself, and you say, hmm, what is the best weight loss strategy? You know, how, uh, what are we going to do to actually get to our ideal body weight? I hope that between last week's session and this week's session, the one take-home lesson that you all have achieved is to be eating low-calorie density foods. Those are the foods that were under the green line. If you stick with eating those and avoid the foods on the other side of the red line, you'll find that you're able to achieve weight loss, that you're getting off of pills, that you're happier and healthier. That's the message that I hope to get across to you today. Is there anything in the chat room we need to? Well, Candace put with? her response. Go ahead and read Candace's uh, issue there. I didn't. OK. I've read that to start gaining health benefits early in weight loss, even 10 pounds gets you the rapid road to health. He actually said that in the video, and that's true. So just even what might be considered minimal weight loss 
for someone who is uh, significantly overweight can go a long way to gaining health benefits. So start on the road, but it will keep going if you're focusing on what you're choosing to eat and how you're choosing to move. And we're going to get to the exercise, Pete, in a moment after we get to a couple more questions. Leslie first and then Nancy. What, thank you. What's the energy density of um, unsweetened almond milk? Is it low because it's got a lot of liquid in it? Um, I haven't given this much thought about the actual energy density of almond milk. Um, My guess is it would be pretty low, just like soda. Cause it's, cause it's a lot of weight, but not a lot of calories. But, but the thing with things like almond milk, you're not, hopefully you're not treating it like a food because it's just, you're just putting it in a recipe or you're putting it on your oatmeal or something like that. It's not, you know, it's not a significant source of calories. So I wouldn't really, you know, you wouldn't be wanting to just drink glasses and glasses of almond milk, especially if it's, you wouldn't want any, anything that's sweetened either. Cause that's just empty calories. But, um, but yeah, I would, I would kind of put it in the same even though it's healthier than soda, I would put it in the same realm as far as when you're looking at calorie density. We're generally talking about, usually we say don't get, if you're trying to lose weight, don't get calories from liquids. That's that's number one lesson. And then um, and then you just want to, you know, be focusing on the foods that you're eating, the calorie density. Great answer. It's uh, generally not, uh, you know, the majority of your food. It's just like a garnish. Usually. Like your creamer and your coffee, for example, similar. Yeah, good thought. Nancy. Um, yeah, um, I lost um, about 60 pounds in 15 years. I did not go on a diet. And I couldn't really figure out why I was losing weight. But then I read Barbara Roll's book and I go, oh, I guess that's what I was doing. And then I have another issue, which maybe blew up the subject. You were, but you did mention it. Um, the, the WHO, the carcinogenic foods. And I'm wondering why those aren't labeled as carcinogenic because if something has asbestos or, you know, whole bunch of things are labeled that they're carcinogenic and yet the foods aren't it's a great question it took a long it took a uh, decades for the surgeon general to get a, a label a warning label on cigarettes and so it's a that's a political question so i i can ne i'm never i guess i shouldn't be i should be optimistic but given the status of our politicians and lobbyists and the power of the the food industries I'm not going to hold my breath for getting a, a label on processed foods, even though it should be there based on the World Health Organization. But it's just such a political thing. They have there's a lot of money in the game to keep that keep that from happening. Great answer. <laughs> OK, now we're going to go on to the next video because. Uh, exercise or movement is important in life. And I want to just start out with a chocolate bar density. It's kind of a fun video. Being aware of the energy density of foods is of tremendous value when it comes to controlling our body weight. And I have this simple little illustration to show you just how important it is. Here I have two food items. Exhibit A, the humble carrot, and exhibit B, a chocolate bar. Also with me, I have two friends, Tish and Heather, who have generously offered to eat and run, or at least eat and walk. Now what we're gonna explore is how long does it take to burn off the energy contained within these food items. Now Tish, you get the carrot, and Heather, you get the chocolate bar. Bon appetit.
Okay, Tish, you can stop. It's been five minutes and you've now burned off all the energy contained within that carrot that you consume. So you can relax. Heather, even though I asked you to jog, you've still got some time to go. Stick with it. can stop. Well done. Well done. You know, you have been running now for about 27 minutes and you've burned off all the energy contained within that chocolate bar. Now, the reason I got you to run as compared to walk like Tish is that it would have taken you near on an hour to burn off the energy contained within that food item. And the reason being is that a chocolate bar is about 10 times more dense than the carrot. As you can see, the energy density makes a huge difference. And if you're interested in controlling your body weight, opt for foods that are of low energy density. And for the most part, these are whole plant-based foods as grown. Okay, hopefully you're getting the idea. And now we're gonna go on to how much exercise to sustain weight loss. So let's go back to Gregor. Right now, almost two-thirds of Americans are overweight, and by 2030, more than half our population may be clinically obese. Childhood obesity has tripled, and most of them will grow up to be overweight as well. The United States may be in the midst of raising the first generation since our nation's founding that will have a shorter predicted lifespan than that of the previous generation. The food industry blames inactivity. We just need to move more. But what is the role of exercise in the treatment of obesity? There is considerable debate in the medical literature today about whether physical activity has any role whatsoever in the epidemic of obesity that's swept the globe since the 80s. The increase in calories per person is more than sufficient to explain the U.S. epidemic of obesity. In fact, if anything, the level of physical activity over the last few decades has actually gone up in both Europe and North America. This has important policy implications. Yes, we still need to exercise more, but the priorities for reversing the obesity epidemic should focus on the overconsumption of calories. To work off the increased caloric intake, which for kids is like an extra can of soda and small fries compared to what they were eating back in the 70s, and for adults, like an extra Big Mac a day, to work that off, you'd have to walk like two, mo two hours a day, seven days a week. So exercise can prevent weight gain, but the amount required to prevent weight gain may be closer to you know, twice the current recommendations. Public health advocates have been experimenting with the, including this kind of information, the fast food menu labeled with calories and the number of miles to walk to burn those calories appeared to be most effective in influencing the selection of lower calorie meals. Now, exercise alone may have a small effect, and that small effect can make a you know, big difference on a population scale. A 1% decrease in BMI nationwide might prevent millions of cases of diabetes and heart disease, thousands of cases of cancer. Yeah, but why don't we lose more weight from exercise? It may be because we're just not doing it enough. I mean, the, the small magnitude of weight loss observed from the majority of exercise interventions, you know, where they make people exercise, may be primarily due to how low the doses are of the prescribed exercise. People tend to overestimate how many calories are burned by physical activity. Um, for example, there's, uh, there's this myth that a bout of sexual activity burns a few hundred calories. So hey, you could get a side of fries with that. But if you actually hook people up and measure, en measure energy expenditure during the act, and your study subjects don't get too tangled up with all the wires and hoses, though it may be nearly the metabolic equivalent of calisthenics, given that the average bout of sexual activity only lasts about six minutes, a young man might expend approximately 21 calories during sexual intercourse. Of course, he would have spent roughly one-third that just lying around watching TV, just basal metabolism, 
So the incremental benefit is plausibly on the order of 14 calories. So maybe we could have like one fry with that. Okay, that's a bit of uh, Gregor's humor. And uh, I think the message is, is it's, you, it's hard to out-exercise a bad diet. You know, you just need to focus on what you're eating, but moving throughout the day is important also. And the last video I want to share with you on that particular topic is thousands of video or thousands of vegans studied. And let's see what the study shows. So how do you prevent it? The first study in human history of thousands of vegans was just published in the Journal of the American Diabetes Association. Thousands of U.S. vegans studied for the first time ever. First, let's compare weights. A BMI over 30 is considered obese. Between 25 and 30, overweight, and they used to call under 25 normal weight, but it's no longer the norm. The average BMI in this country is now 28.8. The first question is where do flexitarians fall? A flexitarian is a flexible vegetarian who in this study is, is defined as someone who eats meat once or twice a month, but is basically vegetarian. Where did they fall? Three choices. Heavier than meat eaters, lighter than meat eaters, but still overweight, or on average not overweight at all. So do you think they found flexitarians to be fatter than regular meat eaters? Do you think those who only eat meat a few times a month are skinnier than meat eaters, but still on average overweight? Or do you think if we cut down our meat consumption that low, our weight should normalize? This is America. Even the flexitarians are overweight. But what about the full-time vegetarians, though? Same basic three choices. Do you think vegetarians turned out fatter than flexitarians? Do you think those who don't eat meat are skinnier than those who do, but still, on average, are overweight? Or do you think if you just cut out meat, you'll lose the excess fat? This is America. Even the vegetarians are overweight. But surprisingly, they are a significantly healthier weight than those who eat meat even only a few times a month. You can see where the trend is going. What if those vegetarians cut out dairy and eggs? Would they lose enough weight to become the only dietary group in North America that's actually not overweight? You tell me. Do you think cutting out dairy and eggs makes you gain weight? Do you think it would make you lose, but not enough to make that cut off? Or do you think populations need to cut out meat and dairy and eggs to achieve a healthy weight? This is America, and that means only the vegans are, on average, a healthy weight. And that's, that's like a 40-pound spread between vegans and meat eaters, which is pretty dramatic. But, but maybe it's not their diet. Maybe vegans just tend to exercise more. No. They carefully measured activity levels, and if anything, the vegans in this study exercised less than the meat eaters. Lazy vegans, but still, on average, 40 pounds lighter. I've been sharing that video for, I don't know, 10, 11 years since I first found it. And um, I'm always impressed every time that I see it again. And I hope that you are also, uh, as you're kind of thinking about what you're able to do and why you'd be able to do it. Um, any and questions? Reason, I'll, I'll add Go something. Ahead. And one of the reasons that's a, such a powerful study is because it's the Adventist health studies, uh, one and two. So 
uh, every one of those people in that study were are Seventh Day Adventists, and so they so they've controlled for they have a lot of the same lifestyle. So they, you know, exercise. You know, they, they tend to exercise, treat the body like a temple. They don't smoke, uh, and they tend to eat a pretty healthy diet. So even the the ones that were eating meat occasionally were still eating a pretty overall pretty healthy diet. So so there's consistency throughout those groups which makes it a, gives it more power to that study. The, and that's the, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Adventist Health Study down in Loma Linda, California. So. so did you notice that eating meat just a few times a month makes a difference in being overweight? How is that possible? How could it be that just a few times a month it would make a difference in your overall weight? The hormone changes uh, that it, that are underlying whatever the other changes are that are occurring in your body. It, it's hard to accept that. It would make that much difference. So you go to a friend's house or you go out and eat and say, oh, it's okay if I just have it occasionally, I'll be okay. And then you get frustrated because you're not getting the benefit and you're not achieving the goal you want. That's why we're sharing this with you. Um, and trying to focus your attention on the importance of this. So we're going to go with Trouty first and then a run. I have a question. Uh, vegans, if they eat French fries, will they still lose the weight? I don't eat the French fries on account that I would probably gain weight and it's not healthy anyway. Well, the French fries are cooked in a lot of oil. It's a lot of calories. Mm -hmm. And so uh, French fries, um, uh, vegan cookies, they're considered uh, junk food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you have yeah. an occasional French fry? Like if you could live on one or two, uh, if you could possibly do that, I can't. But if you could, it, it may not make a difference for your life if you were active enough and other things. So each of us are a little different and you get to eat what you want. Uh, there's no policeman here. No one's judging anybody what they choose to do. But try to focus on what are the issues here? And oil is a very high calorie density food, 4,000 calories a pound. All right. And, that, and that's and then, oh, ahead, say in that sorry. study. And in that study, they were not junk food vegans, but there are studies where that show that people that are junk food vegans are eating a lot of processed vegan food, they tend to be overweight and they actually have higher risk for heart disease and diabetes and all cause mortality. So, so you, yeah, you don't want to be a junk food vegan because that that's actually worse in some cases worse than even the standard American diet. So uh, yeah, go ahead, Arun. Uh, yeah, my guess was that People who are flexitarians probably eat a lot more cheese and, you know, things that they are trying to, you know, compensate for not eating meat. That's my guess. Could be. Yeah. Definitely could be. Okay, Scott put in the chat room a very important uh, consideration. Uh, someone asked, should we take vinegar with meals? And the answer is yes. Vinegar helps with weight loss. There's 21 tweaks, not only in his book, How Not to Diet, but on his app. His app is Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen that you can all download on your smartphone. And there's the Daily Dozen button at the bottom, and there's the 21 tweaks on the bottom that you can have right at your fingertips any time of the day to look up about eating preload with water, preload with negative calorie foods, incorporate vinegar, two teaspoons with each meal, understand or enjoy undistracted meals, follow the 20 minute rule, put some black cumin or garlic powder or ground ginger or nutritional yeast or cumin or in your foods. Consider getting some green tea. Stay hydrated. Deflower your diet. And Ken, you came up with the corn flour. If you want to lose weight, you deflower it. Front load your calories. Time restrict your eating. 
Optimize exercise training. Weigh yourself a couple times a day. Complete your implementation intentions. Fast after 7 p.m. Get sufficient sleep. And experiment with mild trend Ellenberg. You have access to all of these options. You can read about them. You can think about them. You can ch literally change your life. And with that said, I want to play you one more video and then we'll come back to some questions. And this one more video is a little bit of a challenge. Maybe it's more than a little bit for a number of you who have struggled so much. But let's listen to what Darren has to say. Well, I would like to issue you a challenge. Do you like challenges? I hope so. This challenge is just for one month. I'm not asking you to sign your life away or make a, you know, a lifelong commitment. I'm just saying for one month, I would like you to conduct an experiment on yourself. An experiment to see what happens if you make radical shifts to the way that you eat and the way that you move. Well, for the next month, I want to challenge you to move as far up the end towards the optimal zone as you're able. And simultaneously, change the way that you move. Break up your prolonged periods of sitting. Engage in moderate intensity physical activity, 30 minutes or more each day, if you can. And what I will tell you is the extent to which you make changes is the extent to which you can expect improvements. And there's a particular group of people that I, I specifically want to talk to. And you'll know that if you're one of these, but there are some of us that need to make substantive changes to our health. You know, you find yourself in a ditch and you may have been in that ditch for some period of time. And yeah, you've, you've made attempts to get out there, but they may have been small attempts. And it's like sort of taking these tiny little leaps trying to escape. And it actually becomes demotivating after a while. The best way to escape a ditch is to make a quantum leap. And so if you're one of those people that you know that you need to make those changes, I really want to encourage you over the next month as a self-experiment, give this a go. Change the way that you eat, change the way that you move, and you may well discover that this is a journey in a transformation towards living more. Okay, as you see, I have a number of different videos on here. I'm leaving on here in case you want to take a screenshot uh, with a picture. You, these videos are found either on Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen site or they're found on YouTube. Uh, there are so many different kinds of videos that you could watch every single day during the month that you're doing your, your challenge. Um, or experiment on your life. So I will stop the share at this point. If you wanna see it again sometime, I'll come back to it. Just gonna see if there's any questions from anyone, cause we really do wanna give you time to ask your questions and have a little more discussion about this. Any thoughts from anyone else? I have a question. Uh, go ahead, Kim. Jamie, what are you making? <laughs> I thought about saying something, but I didn't think anybody would notice. I make um, little dog and cat puzzles. They sell them at WAGS on Coburg Road, and they send the money to the Community Vet Center for people with low low income people who can't afford to take their pets to the vet. Can you show us how they, what they look like? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to, but um, let's see. Um, let me get one from over here that has a, a name. Um, um, okay, so this one is, um, that one's uh, called I'm a foot long hot dog and they're filled on the inside with a peanut butter sandwich in between milk bones. This one is called That's Some Good Nip, Man, and that one's filled with catnip pouches. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was I was intrigued. I'm sorry. I didn't know you could all see me moving my hands. It's okay. <laughs> uh, we're all uh, part of this uh, family, you know, we have 
we engage in different activities and like to see how that's going. Yeah, I care about animals. Well, we appreciate that. We do too, actually. I know. Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine is one of those caring for animal organizations that we really support. Okay, um, who else? Any other thoughts? Anybody had some success with weight loss or has struggled? Um, I know that in the past we've had a section a session on food addiction, and I don't know, Scott, did you say you were planning on doing that in the future? Yeah. Yeah. So next next week is an open forum, and then two weeks from today is uh, be, food addiction and behavior change. So we'll uh, address some of those issues there. That, that's a part of this as well. And I alluded to that last week when I discussed calorie density. That we're talking, you know, more literal about foods that you eat and choose and calorie density, and that's all well and good. But there we have to address people that have some emotional eating issues, food addiction issues, which is more common than you might think. So uh, that needs to be addressed as well. Okay, Aran and then Edward. Thank you, thank you, uh, let's see, Charlie. I wanted to say that maybe I have a problem. I have not changed my weight in about last 40 years. I don't know. Yeah. And I haven't, I haven't tried to lose or gain weight. It just, whatever happens, no well, change. have you um, been eating mainly a plant-based diet during that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a testimonial that eating a plant-based diet, we didn't say he's eating totally whole plant foods. We said most of his life he's been eating a plant-based diet and has right. been able to maintain his weight. That's the point, yes? Yeah, yeah. I have had some cheese, you know, every now and then. Okay. Yeah. All right. Edward. Uh, so you, you mentioned before, um, a little while ago, about um, uh, fruits that brown, um, like apples. Bananas. I, bananas and stuff put into smoothies. Uh, your your screen kind yeah. of froze up a little bit there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we weird. can hear you now. Okay, yeah, the browning fruits, um, not ideal for smoothies. Um, but then it occurred to me, where does that put an ice cream? Uh, ice cream? Um, so you could eat a uh, nice cream by itself, uh, which would be, you know, bananas that are just ground up. Right. And if you had some other fruit with it or other antioxidants, they'd have a lesser value but right. right that's but what it, it wouldn't be i think it's about a 30 percent less uh value so ideally you would eat those fruits at a separate time but if you had them together and you're eating enough other fruits and vegetables throughout the day you're probably doing okay okay I mean, we're talking more about theory in my, in, you know, oh. I'm still eating a few prunes with my banana in the morning uh, with a few nuts uh, just because I get so much other antioxidants in the morning uh, that I say uh, and throughout the day that I think it's okay. Um, so, Scott, how, what's your thought on this? Yeah, same. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of, a, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't hear the 30% thing. I didn't know exactly how much it drops it, but yeah, it's a matter of, so polyphenol oxidase is the enzyme that causes the browning of fruits, such as bananas, apples, and avocados. And it just reduces the antioxidant effects of the other fruits and vegetables you might have with it. So like if you're putting in blueberries and cocoa powder into your smoothie, 
because you want the extra antioxidants, it's just going to be not as potent or as valuable as it, as it was because of the banana that's in there. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I agree with Charlie. If it's something you just really like and you're going to eat antioxidant rich foods throughout the rest of the day, it's going to be fine. But just kind of one of those caveats that, oh, wow, we didn't know that. This is new, new data. So, uh, so for me, it, it made me change. I, I used to put banana in my groats in the morning and now I don't because I have cocoa powder in there and blueberries and I want to get all the, all the antioxidants I can from that. So I eat it. If I have a banana, I just have it like later in the morning or something. Okay. Good question. Jamie. I just wanted to thank you for asking that question because one of my favorite smoothies is that apple and greens that you can get at J Jamba Juice. So I was all bummed out after you guys shared that information last time. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> to bum you out, <laughs> but there is life after thinking about it and just living life. We're not, it. yeah, we're not going to kill the messenger. Thank you. <laughs> I'll run. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, how good are raisins as antioxidants? Especially raisins that you make yourself. I think raisins are good. I don't think they're quite as good as blueberries and and uh, cocoa. Uh -huh. uh, okay. But... I still think they're probably pretty good. I, okay. I don't. I don't have a number off the top of my head. Right. Okay. But uh, green tea is good, right? Very or, good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. okay. How about Thank Mac? You. Mac plus one other raised hand. So let's see, Mac. I wonder who Mac is. You can unmute. I got to look around the gallery. Uh, yeah, Mac, I'm going to ask you to unmute here. Let's see if I can click on that. Max is Joan. Joan? So, Joan, unmute yourself. Okay. There so you go. I have a challenge for you, Dr. Ross. Yes, ma'am. After seeing what you have for breakfast, <laughs> yeah. and we're reading the book Fiber Fuel. Yes. And he really is a proponent of diversity. Yes. I would like you to count how many plant sources your breakfast comes from. 35 to 40. What? I've done it. 35 oh. to 40. What to 40? 35 to 40. That is outstanding. Thank you. <laughs> it takes a while to put all those things, you know, a little of this, a little mustard powder or, uh, a, a, you know, a touch of vinegar, vinegar, of balsamic vinegar, the de various different kinds of greens that are chopped up. Um, I don't know. I think we have five different kinds of greens uh, most every morning and then jicama and radish and garlic. And, you know, um, it, it goes on and on. It's kind of fun. I'm doing it with my wife. We're chopping in the kitchen together, putting it together for ourselves and now for our granddaughter. And um, so it's an activity that we're doing for fun in our life, literally. Um, it does take time, and I know the medical students I interact with don't have time to to have that many options for their breakfast. It's a lot. Thanks for the question. Ken, go ahead. Well, what was the subject just before that? <laughs> uh, I think it was a run who talked uh, just before that. Um, and I can't remember what, what that was. I'm sorry. I'm just, ha I have, yeah, I had a little memory issues. Okay. A run, you want to help us out? Yeah. I asked about raisins as antioxidants. Yeah, that's what it was. Raisins and antioxidants. Okay. Here's, here's what I was going to ask. 
so I've been, been hearing that uh, colored vegetables and fruit are better than lighter ones, like purple onions, red onions are better than white onions. Um, yes. Grapes. I've heard, you know, black and red grapes be better than green grapes. But I also, I also heard, they, I think you're the one that said it, you should eat the seeds. You should buy seeded grapes with seeds in them and eat the seeds. Did I hear that right? I don't think I said that because I don't eat the seeds of grapes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I not me. It wasn't was me not, either. <laughs> huh? You it know. wasn't me either. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where that came from. Well, I don't even know where to get grapes with seeds in them. They're all it's the hard to find them these days. Seed, seedless grapes. Yeah. Well, you can you can get grape seed extracts in a bottle. Yes. <laughs> then it's probably processed because usually with those kind of things, they heat the they heat it up and then press them to death, and okay. and it becomes you got the oil problem then. Uh, calorie density, oil. So I I don't know. I'm not going to eat grape seeds. No, I, I keep the seeds on the side for now. Um, someone is asking, are smoothies good or not? And it depends on what you put in the smoothie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're adding greens and fruit, fruit and vegetables into your smoothie, it's probably a, a whole lot better choice than eating uh, uh, bacon and eggs. Um, <laughs> and and yet, you know, if you're putting in processed, refined sugars, uh, that wouldn't be healthy. And Gregor recommends that you don't drink the smoothie too quickly, that you try to drink it over the time period it would take to chew that amount of food that you put in your smoothie. So if it would take you 20 minutes to get through uh eating the greens and the other stuff in the smoothie, um, try to take that same amount of time as you're sipping it. So a lot of people love their smoothies and it's fine. Now, there was just a new article he came out with uh, this week. He had a video where he was talking about uh, biting down and chewing and how that uh, may uh, prevent cognitive lo loss. If you haven't seen that video from this week, I'd encourage you to watch that. And uh, you may want to add a little bit more chew into your life. Arun, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I uh, wanted to say that I love papaya, but whenever I buy papaya, I also end up eating the seeds inside it, the black seeds. And they remind me of black pepper. But uh, do you know if uh, the seeds are good for you? I mean, I heard they were good for, but I don't know. Do you? I've Scott? walked the track with you. You've maintained your ideal body weight. You look like you're pretty healthy. And so if you've been doing this forever, I don't see any reason to stop. I have, do not know whether the seeds have any toxin or any problem with them, it's probably okay to eat as my gut reaction after looking at you. Yeah. Does anybody else have a thought on that? I think the stone fruit, the stone fruits make people, cause that almond shaped thing inside of them has got a little bit of cyanide in it. Right. So, mm -hmm. so that makes people afraid of seeds, but I've been eating apples and pears and oranges and eating up seeds my whole life. And uh, it's just more convenient than worrying about what to do with them. Just eat the whole thing. I hate the whole apple. The the papaya seed, I mean, the papaya seeds are really good. You know, if you chew in them, they taste like black pepper. Uh -huh. and they're easy to break in, unlike apple seeds. <laughs> so, Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I think Ken made a good point there. There's certain seeds that are that are actually health promoting and some that are actually not recommended. So I guess it'd just be a matter of trying to look it up, a source you can trust and 
See, is yeah. it safe to eat, you know, papaya seeds or because like uh, Ken said, I know we have stone fruit, like, you know, even dates and avocados and some of those kinds of things. If they're they're uh, toxic. You shouldn't eat the seeds, but, uh, but you can't yeah. even chew them. <laughs> so Ma'am. doing a quick Google search, whether you could trust it or not, their edible contain fiber, healthy fatty acids and other beneficial compounds, including polyphenols and flavonoids flavonoids uh and so they do have a, a peppery taste it says and it's generally safe to consume um some people find them unappealing due to their spicy pepper-like flavor so i'm not sounds ready to like take the leap yet but it sounds like you can keep doing it a run thank you thank you Thanks for the question. This, this has been fun, uh, this session. Um, any last questions that are burning on your mind? Uh, let's see, I'm just kind of looking through the questions here. Okay, Scott, anything else that you wanna add before we get done with today's session? That's good. Just open, uh, open forum. So all questions and whatever you guys want to talk about next week and then uh, food addiction and behavior change in two weeks. That's what's coming up. Very good. So if any of you have any questions and need some additional help, feel free to get in touch. Uh, we'll be happy to talk to you. Nancy, one last question. You're muted. The Better Health Summits, and Chef AJ will um, interview I me. Mean, once in a while, I've seen Dr. Gregor on and, and some other um, of these whole food plant-based people. Yeah. yeah, she's excellent, Chef AJ. I always enjoy listening to her podcast. So if anybody's interested, they can do it for free for, I think it goes a few more days. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we'll catch you next week. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, yeah. everyone who asked questions. Thanks. See you next Bye -bye. time. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.